Hey guys, Nate here. Except, I'm not Nate. Nate is a stage name, a, a pen name, or a, an alter ego. Maybe not an alter ego, but you know what I mean. It's a, a fake name that I made up to use to be a public figure because I want to protect my privacy. In the privacy community, this is what we call disinformation, and this is one of the most powerful things that you can use to help protect your privacy. Although admittedly, it can also very quickly become confusing and kind of a gray area. So in this video, I wanna to talk to you guys about disinformation and what it is and how to use it properly and how to not get in trouble using it. So first of all, let's define disinformation, because that's a word that's getting thrown around a lot these days. And unfortunately, it's probably not the best word for use in the privacy community. Disinformation generally refers to knowingly giving someone false information with malicious intentions, like to deceive them or to gain something in return at their cost. That last part in particular is why this is not really the best use of terms in the privacy community, because when I talk about disinformation, I'm not talking about trying to defraud someone or trying to act maliciously. Rather, I'm talking about trying to protect yourself and compartmentalize your life, which again, we'll get to a little bit more in a minute. When I was looking through definitions for making this video, I came across the definition of misdirection, which is probably a more fitting term for what we're trying to do here. Misdirection might make you think of like a magician, for example, and truthfully could also be used in a malicious way. For example, you could misdirect someone to look over here while you're picking their pocket and stealing their wallet. Or alternately, you could misdirect someone to look over here while you pull an illusion and make it seem like you just pulled a rabbit out of a hat. As with everything in the privacy community, there are pros and cons. I'm going to continue using the word disinformation because in the privacy community, that's generally what we call it. But again, I want to reiterate, the point here is not to be malicious. We're not trying to defraud anyone. We're not trying to mislead someone for malicious reasons. We're trying to do it to protect our data. So of course that leads to the question of how does one use disinformation to protect your data? Well, for starters, if you use something like Brave or a VPN, you're already using disinformation at a very small scale. For example, Brave randomizes your fingerprint every time to help make you harder to track. And a VPN replaces your IP address with someone else's. You are intentionally giving them false information with the intention of protecting your data. You can also use disinformation to protect yourself from spam. For example, I've talked in previous videos about using voice over IP or using alias email addresses. So that way, if you start getting a lot of spam, you can just shut off that number or that email address and move on with your life. This in conjunction with the whole Brave or VPN thing is also useful for escaping targeted ads, which I don't know if I've discussed this on video, but I've discussed in blog posts in the past how that can actually be straight up detrimental. There are tons of stories online of like recovering alcoholics getting ads for liquor stores or vodka or would be parents who just had a miscarriage that are now getting ads for baby products. This stuff has real world impacts. It's not always about being paranoid and hiding from government oppression. Sometimes there's day to day things that I don't think any reasonable person would call you crazy for not wanting to be subjected to that. On that note, disinformation can be used to protect yourself from doxing and from data breaches. For example, should you decide to be a public figure, there are inevitably going to be people who don't like what you had to say, and they're going to try to make you pay for it through intimidation, AKA doxing. If you are intentionally feeding a lot of false information like fake addresses, fake names, fake phone numbers, it becomes harder for them to find out the real information that might still be out there and to target that. It sends them off on a wild goose chase where they're not gonna find you, they're too busy chasing false leads. Likewise, with data breaches, a lot of these data breaches we cover these days leak things like your social security number, your date of birth, your contact information, and these are all things that can be used to steal your identity. More often than not, when you go online to do some sort of a credit check, they ask you for details about your past life. They might say like, which one of these streets have you lived on? Or who have you had a car loan through? And again, if you've been really studious about removing your information and planting fake information, it becomes harder for would-be identity thieves to guess the answers to those questions. And actually, I forgot to put this in my show notes, but I should point out that in my opinion, disinformation is most effective when it is used in conjunction with data removal. I've talked about that in another video, whether you choose to go with an automated service or whether you choose to do it yourself. If you remove as much information as you can, and then you use a lot of disinformation to put fake leads out there, that sort of buries the real information and helps protect you even more. So using those two things together are super powerful. 
And finally, I'm gonna talk about this one a little later in the video, but disinformation can be used to help resist social pressure. For example, let's say you go out to eat and they say, hey, what's your phone number? Because we're gonna text you when your table's ready. Rather than making a big deal about like, I don't wanna give you my phone number, can't you just lean outside and call my name? Now I don't wanna give you a name. You can give them a voice over IP number that you only ever use once. Or when you're checking out online, most places online will not let you check out without a phone number. I don't know why I've never had anyone call me except for Amazon on a phone number that I did not give them. That's a true story. But for some reason, they pretend like they really need your phone number. So rather than fighting with tech support who probably can't override it anyways, even if they wanted to, you can just give them a fake number and move on. So on that note, let's real quick outline some limitations to disinformation. For example, when shouldn't you use disinformation? And the answer is pretty much any time it's legally required and you could get in trouble. So for example, if you are filing a police report or you get pulled over for speeding, probably not the best time to use your fake name and information. Sorry, officer, I... I didn't know I couldn't do that. If you are filing your taxes, definitely filing your taxes. Do not use fake information. The government does not play around when it comes to taxes. On that note, if you are starting at a new job, now this one's kind of tricky because what I usually do is I put an abbreviated version of my first name, like Nate, and then I use a PO box. I don't consider that fraudulent because it is my PO box and my name. The government knows where to find me. I'm still giving them a real date of birth, a real social security number. I'm still paying my taxes. And for the record, that's why I say when it comes to your employer, you should give them real information because I don't know how many of you guys know this, your employer pays half of the taxes. They're paying taxes on your behalf. You're also paying taxes out of your paycheck. And again, the government does not mess around when it comes to taxes. So new hire paperwork is not the time to lie. Now, again, I just wanna stress, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know how legal it is. You could probably get away with putting like a PO box or a friend's address if the friend knows and consents to that, but definitely not the place to wholesale make things up. You will get in trouble. Another big one is medical stuff. Do not ever lie to your doctors. Now, in some cases, this is kind of like the employer thing. It might be a matter of insurance. So you have to give them real information so they can verify your insurance and charge it accordingly. Unfortunately, we are starting to see a huge rise in medical data breaches that include things like medical notes, prescriptions, diagnosis information, and that's really unfortunate. But unfortunately, I don't have an answer to that right now because the fact is, if you're going to see a doctor, you probably have a reason to be seeing them and you shouldn't be lying. If your arm is hurting, don't walk into the doctor's office and say, oh, my leg is hurting. The doctor is not there to judge you. And unfortunately, like I said, there is a risk of a breach there, but I don't have an answer to that. But your health and safety should always come first above privacy. So don't lie to your doctors. They're trying to help you. Just hope for the best, I guess. This whole section can really be summarized in one question. What do people actually need to know about me? Again, your employer needs to know that information about you because they have to pay taxes and report it to the IRS. The doctor needs to know that information so that they can treat you accurately. But then of course, we've got the obvious ones. Like I mentioned earlier, when you order something online, they want your phone number. I have never had an online place call me if there's a question about my order. They email me. Or more and more these days, they just tell me that my account was flagged for potential fraud and tell me to screw off. Or again, when signing up for a lot of accounts, they don't actually need your name and your date of birth. They just wanna make sure you're old enough that they're not liable for what you do on their site. You can make up a name, you can use an alias email address, all these kinds of things. Now for the record, technically, yes, that violates the terms of service. Although personally, I've never heard of anyone actually getting in trouble for that. And I think there's some bigger questions there if the company's actually going to enforce that. That's just my opinion. I've never been kicked off a website for using a fake name, although I've heard Facebook's pretty aggressive about that, but they're the only ones, and it kind of makes sense because they're a garbage company who exists to steal all your data. Facebook aside, most of them aren't gonna do that. And again, personal opinion, if they're gonna be strict about it, is that really a website that you wanna be using? If they don't need that data and they're gonna ban you because they found out you were lying, they're probably not a good website to be using. Okay, so here's what I used to struggle with for the longest time, and that's where to find good disinformation. For name, I found it very helpful to use online name generators. Now there's a lot of these out there. My personal favorite is behind the name, but there's also like a lot of baby websites where it'll help you come up with baby names, things of that nature. In my experience, it helps to pick a very vanilla convincing name that fits you. So for example, I'm a white American guy. Nathan Bartram is a very believable name and that's why I use it. If I was Middle Eastern, I might go with something a little more Middle Eastern sounding. Or again, since I'm a white guy from America, Muhammad would be kind of a weird name for me to use, even though technically it is the most common name in the world. 
Likewise, if you're a girl, you probably don't want to go by, you know, Andrew or Bob. I mean, I guess you can, you can do whatever you want, but I'm just saying, you're probably gonna get less weird looks if you go that route. For some people, this may feel kind of like lying, or maybe you're in a situation that doesn't necessarily require a completely fake name, like at work, for example. So you could go with a nickname or a shortened name. So for example, again, Nate instead of Nathan, you could go by your middle name, or again, depending on where you are, a lot of the time online, it's totally normal to call somebody by their username or their handle. These are all totally acceptable things that don't require your real name. On that note, this is semi-related, but when signing up for accounts online, I recommend randomly generating usernames. You can do this with Bitwarden, for example, if you have a Bitwarden account, or you can use your password generator to generate random words if you set it to passphrase and then combine two of those and there's your username. I'll talk about that more in another video, but it is kind of related here, so I wanted to throw that tip out there. Email addresses are fairly easy in my opinion. I've talked about email aliasing in the past and that works pretty well there. Bonus points if you have the money to set up a wildcard or a on the fly domain and then you can just make stuff up on the spot. Alternately, some people prefer to have just a few email addresses that they use in general areas of their life. So for example, you could have one email address you use for job hunting and professional related stuff. And then you could have another one that you use for emailing the friends and family. You have another one that you use for online shopping and social media, stuff like that. I'll talk about that more in a second. Phone numbers are a little trickier because it's hard to find ones that work. Some websites like Discord and Twitter slash X, for example, they have to have a valid SIM card number. They will not accept voice over IP, and a lot of the time they just won't let you use the service unless you provide one. In those situations, I encourage you to ask, do I actually need this service? Some people might choose to have a separate pay-as-you-go SIM number that they only use for those kind of services if they do need them. Mint Mobile is a really popular option for this. In the time since I recorded this video, there has been a new app on the scene called Cloaked. It's trying to be like a total credential management app. It generates emails and I think maybe even passwords. But what's really interesting to me is the phone number functionality. Now, I haven't tested this personally yet. I want to and I hope to do a video about it when I do. But Cloaked in an interview claims that their phone numbers work as valid phone numbers and not just voice over IP, but like a regular SIM card phone number. So you guys could look into that one. I think it's only available in America right now. I haven't personally tried it, so use at your own risk, but that is an option I wanted to put on everybody's radar at this part. Like I said, hopefully I will have a full video coming soon. When it comes to online ordering, most of the time they don't actually seem to care. I've never tried it, but you could probably put in just straight fives, which here in America is an invalid phone number. That's why you see it in like movies and TV shows all the time. You know, yeah, five, 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 one, two, three, four. It's a fake number, it's never gonna ring. You could also use a voice over IP number if it's something that you think you might actually wanna get a response for, like, you know, the doctor's office or work, for example. You might actually expect them to call you or you might need to contact somebody at that number. And then of course, if you are 100% certain that you don't need to contact that person, there are tons of fake and prank phone numbers online. There's all kinds of ones for breaking up with people. There's some that just ring infinitely that don't say or do anything funny. And there's my personal favorite, which just plays never gonna give you up over and over and over again. So yeah, there's a lot of options out there. For a physical address, there's a number of options. Again, if this is something where you think you are actually going to need to receive like a physical good or some mail, there's a PO box or a friend or relative's address, which I'll get to in a second, again, with their consent. If you're pretty confident that you're never gonna need this, what I would do is find either a large hotel complex or my new favorite is a large hotel in the area and use that instead. Now, real quick, on the topic of like using a middle name or using a friend's address, it's important to note that if your threat model is particularly high, this could still out you. Now, this is gonna work for like automated data scraping, but if someone's actually trying to dox you, and let's say I use my brother's address to send something, if people figure that out, they can look him up and say, oh, this is Nate's brother, that's Nate, or probably Nate, based on what I can find about him and find more information from there. Again, for the average person who's not a public figure, who doesn't really get involved online, doesn't post a lot, this is probably not a big deal. It will protect you from the automated data scraping, but it's not going to be foolproof against a dedicated adversary, even one who doesn't have a ton of resources. It's really hard to keep your data off the internet. We've kind of talked about that before. So this could be a cheap solution for people who can't afford a PO box, or again, don't have a very high threat model, but if you have a particularly high threat model, I would do everything in your power to keep this away from your family. 
And that actually leads me to my last point, which is compartmentalization. I've kind of touched on this a little bit throughout the video, but for most people, the vast majority of everything they do can be simply summarized using that word. So for example, at my day job, like a lot of places, we have branded gear. We have, you know, hats and coffee mugs and shirts that have the work logo on them and stuff. And I wear hats sometimes, you know? Rather than ordering those items and sending them to my house or even my PO box, I can send them to the office. Somebody's gonna be there to receive them. They're gonna make sure it gets to me. It's not a big deal. And again, personally, if it's something where I don't ever expect to actually need mail, I make sure I put in a local hotel. They've probably gotten quite a bit of junk mail in my name by now, but also to be honest, I'm never gonna stay there. So I don't really care. Again, with the name thing, I was very careful to pick a name that doesn't have my real name anywhere in it. So even if you find my family members or even me, you may not necessarily realize you're looking at my information. A lot of this stuff is really as simple as asking, what personality do I put this in? If it's work-related stuff, put it in the work phone number with the work email and send it to the work address. Except for maybe like a job offer from a new job, I don't think your current job would appreciate that very much. If it's personal stuff, then let me send it to a PO box with that email address and that phone number. Just compartmentalizing like that will actually get most people most of the way there in terms of protecting their information. Now, I forgot to put this in the show notes, but as I'm talking, one thing that occurs to me is some people might be wondering, Nate, you mentioned that using disinformation intentionally alongside removing your public information can really throw people off the trail. So what if I wanna do that? Well, that's actually pretty straightforward. For example, you can sign up for rewards programs. You can go to your local grocery store, sign up and put in your fake phone number and your fake address on there. You could also sign up for social media and put your information on there. I can tell you from personal experience, LinkedIn gets scraped like crazy. If you sign up for a LinkedIn account and put a fake address on there, I guarantee you it'll be online everywhere in a couple of months. It's ridiculous how bad LinkedIn leaks data. If you wanna be a little bit more active, you could go out of your way to create disinformation. For example, on a lot of my social media posts, I say that I'm from Texas, but have we ever actually proved that? I mean, it's probably a safe bet that I'm somewhere in the central time zone, just if you pay attention to like when I'm online and stuff. But I mean, I could be in Minnesota. I could be in Oklahoma. I should be in Colorado. Colorado's nice. If you're gonna go that route, it generally helps to like have some knowledge of the area you've been in. Like for example, I've been to New York a few times. I could probably pull that one off if I had to. I'm not gonna make up maybe living in Albuquerque cause I've never done that. That wouldn't be very convincing now, would it? You can also sign up for a lot of magazines. There's a lot of magazines out there that are free. Bonus points if they're things you're not actually interested in. You know, you could sign up for a gardening magazine or an audio magazine. Again, there's PO boxes, which might still be linked to you, but at least they'll get your real address where you lay your head out of the system and make it harder to find, which in my opinion is really the big deal. Personally, for my threat model, I don't really care if people know my PO box. I'm much more interested in not having people harass me and my wife where we live. Really, it's just a matter of every time you see the opportunity to sign up for something and you can put in fake information and it won't actually impact your receiving that good or service, that's a great opportunity for you to go ahead and start planting some disinformation. So just keep your eyes and ears open for those kind of opportunities. And then of course, I just wanna reiterate, because I know someone's gonna say it in the comments, this is general advice for most people with a lower threat model. If you have an actual abusive ex who like works for the police department or works for Google, who's hunting you down, or you are Edward Snowden running from the CIA, this video probably doesn't apply to you. You have a much higher threat model, you need to think a lot harder, and you need to put a lot more steps in between you and that disinformation. It's gonna be a lot more complicated because your attacker has a lot more resources. But again, for the average person who says, I just don't want people to steal my identity. I don't want doxers to get mad because I said that chocolate is better than vanilla or abbreviations count in Scrabble or whatever. I don't want those people making me feel unsafe at home. If you're in that boat, this stuff will probably work for you. And again, I wanna reiterate, nothing's 100% bulletproof and it's probably not gonna work on its own. I would definitely use it in conjunction with some kind of data removal, but it's a great start. And again, personally, for the longest time, I was using disinformation just to cut down on junk, just to not have to deal with spam emails and junk mail and all this crap showing up. Pretty much the only junk mail I ever get anymore is around election time. I'll get like maybe half a dozen flyers saying, vote for me. But for the most part, that's about all I get anymore. I don't get a lot of spam emails. I don't get a lot of spam texts. I get a lot less robocalls than most of my coworkers. Anyways, point being, as always, nothing is unhackable. I don't wanna tell you that this is gonna make you bulletproof or protect you from everything, but it does go a long way. It gets you like 80% of the way there and it makes your life a little easier and it's not as hard as you think it is. Just sit down, come up with a couple addresses, set aside a couple of voice over IP phone numbers and go from there.
Sorry guys, I didn't make as tight of notes as I usually do for these videos. I had two more things pop into my head. So number one, a lot of people feel stressed when they're put on the spot. For example, maybe you're going to check out somewhere and they're telling you, hey, we need your phone number in case you decide to return this thing. First of all, I would push back and say, just print me a receipt. I will hold on to the receipt. I will make sure not to lose it. More often than not, they can. And as a general rule, people don't like confrontation. So if they say, hey, we need your phone number and you say, no thanks, I don't wanna do that. Well, what if you decide to return it? Just print me a receipt, I won't lose it, I'll be fine. And more often than not, they'll just leave it at that. Like, oh, okay, your choice. And they'll print it off for you. If you do need to turn over a phone number and you're like scrolling through your phone to find this voice over IP number, my first piece of advice is people don't care. Like they get paid by the hour. You can sit there all day and look for your phone number. That's not their problem. But if you are feeling pressured for some reason, like maybe there's a line behind you or something, all you have to do is say like, I just got a new phone number, hold on a second. Or, you know, oh, we just moved. Hold on, let me look up the new address. I have it written down here in my notes. That alone, in, in my opinion, removes a lot of that tension. People are like, oh, okay, you know, he just moved. He doesn't know his address. Or she just got a new phone, doesn't know the phone number. These things happen. The second thing is to be aware of the fact that in my experience, if you use obviously fake information, you are much more likely to get flagged when you do online purchases. So for example, I used to do John Smith at 123 Main Street and I got my stuff flagged pretty much constantly. But ever since I switched to, you know, Nate Bartram at downtown hotel address, all of a sudden people don't seem to really care. I feel like I get flagged a lot less. I mean, I do still get flagged sometimes because, you know, VPN and privacy card and things like that, but it's a lot less common. So. I highly recommend that you actually take the time to sit down and again, find a real address, preferably somewhere that's not going to get anybody hurt, like an abandoned building or a PO box or something, and then use that. It's gonna be a lot more convincing and you're gonna run into a lot less issues. By the way, here in the US, uh, I, I don't know about everywhere, but every PO box I've ever had offers to let you use the street address. I know with USPS, you may have to fill out an additional paperwork. It's one page and it's totally free. One of the private mailboxes I used to use is definitely just included. Like, hey, by the way, here's our street address. You can send stuff here. And then again, I can't possibly cater to every possible scenario out there. But one thing that's worth being aware of is if you're in like a government position where you have to do a background check, using all these aliases could come back to bite you if you don't keep track of them because that's kind of part of a background check is they wanna know like every name you've ever had, every identity you've ever used, all your accounts online, things like that. But I'm assuming that if you're in that job field, you're probably already aware of those kind of risks. I just wanted to throw that out there. All right, I'm sorry if that one was a little rambly. Like I said, my notes weren't as tight as they usually are for this video. Honestly, at this point, I've been using disinformation for several years and it's kind of become a little bit of second nature to me. It's something I don't really think about. I have all my phone numbers ready to go. I have my wildcard domain so I can just make up an email address if I have to. My wife has the simple login app on her phone. So I've seen her do it before where somebody's like, what's your email address? And she's like, hold on a minute. And she pulls out the app and makes one up on the spot. The more you do this, the more comfortable you'll get with it. And the more it becomes easier. I don't wanna say it becomes second nature. You don't really think about it, but you just know what to do. Like, oh, who's asking? What are they asking for? Here's what information I wanna give them. And you might mess up a few times at first. I mean, that's the name of the game, right? That's how life is. And especially if you've been doing this privacy thing for a minute, you probably know that too. Like, oh man, I used this email when I should have used this one, or I, I downloaded this messenger and it turned out to not be right. Let me try this other one. That's just how things go. But there's no time to get started like the present because, you know, as the old saying goes, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. I hope that helped. Like I said, disinformation is kind of a very nebulous, potentially gray area that can get really confusing. But once you get out there, you start using it, you start getting the hang of it. It's actually a lot easier than you think. And it really pays dividends in terms of protecting you from data breaches and things like that. So get out there, start using it legally. Don't lie to anybody important. Start getting familiar with it. And in time, you'll be a master. And with that, I will see you soon in the next video.